Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of American Civil War with your hosts, Bang and Dang, and one episode removed from the Seven Days Battles and effectively the end of the Peninsula Campaign. And McClellan's career, pretty much. He'll survive for a little bit until Antietam, but after that, he's gone. Then he's like, Lincoln, I shall defeat you in the presidential election, which I won't even come close to it. If he would have, he would still be alive. Lincoln, that is. Uh, yeah, probably, right? No, not, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. Possible. I would hope not. 200 years old. 150. No, he was born in what 30s damn near 200 right hey. he had been he was more than 30 something when he was president so he had been born in like 20s or 15s or something right Whatever. teens tens anywho we got the battles of cotton plant first murfreesboro baton rouge and kirksville baton rouge is a whole bunch of nothing uh -huh. um i don't think any of these are um any of them too much action no here. there's a lot of action that you guys better listen to this shit you guys are gonna be surprised on all the murders and action in these ones coming up. Most action-packed episode we're about to have here, boys. <laughs> well, we're having an action at a uh, Battle Cotton Plant, also known as Action at Hills Plantation, or the Action at Cash River, or the Action at Round Hill on July seventh, eighteen sixty-two. Fought in Woodruff County, Arkansas, hmm. a few weeks after the Union victory of the Battle of Pea Ridge. We did that hmm. on uh, March seventh through the eighth, eighteen sixty-two. Union General Curtis. Received reports that General Van Dorn's Confederate, they were moving east. April 5th, Curtis's department commander, General Henry Halleck, authorized a move eastward to block a possible offensive by Van Dorn. Okay. Accordingly, the Army of the Southwest marched east through the Missouri towns of Cassville, Forsyth, and West Plains. In fact, March 23rd, General Albert Sidney Johnston ordered Van Dorn's troop to move to Corinth, Mississippi, where they did the Battle of Corinth. Right. Um, and in his zeal to execute the new instructions, Van Dorn denuded Arkansas of soldiers, weapons, ammunition, and denuded, huh? And other military supplies. Ironically, his troops arrived too late to fight in the Battle of Shiloh on April 6th through 7th, which was a Confederate defeat. It's because you stopped to uh, plumb. What do they call it? Yes. Plumage? They did, sure. Pillage? You stopped and pillaged all these damn things. Purge. Pillaged. Raped. Pillaged. You know, killed, murdered, all that stuff. Well, after Shiloh, Halleck instructed Curtis to move into northeast Arkansas and rendezvous with another federal force under General Frederick Steele. Steele. Curtis's army marched south from the White Plains, crossing the state line on the 29th of April and reaching Batesville, Arkansas on the 2nd of May. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Steele's soldiers arrived in nearby Jacksonport on the 4th of May. However, Halleck directed Curtis to move half of his infantry to Cape Girardeau, where they would be transferred east of the Mississippi. East. Dutifully, Curtis gathered seven Illinois regiments, two Missouri regiments, and one Indiana. Placed them under house arrest. <laughs> <laughs> Placed them under General Jefferson C. Davis oh. and Alexander Asboth and sent them to Halleck. Okay. Curtis reorganized his remaining soldiers into three divisions. Three divisions. The Indiana regiments in the first under Steele. The Illinois and Iowa regiments in the second under General Eugene Asakar. And the Missouri regiments in the third under General Peter J. Osterhaus. Oh, he's German. Yes. Halleck then ordered Curtis to occupy Little Rock, Ooh. about 100 miles south. In the month of May, Curtis's strength returns listed 6,000 infantry, 3,000 cavalry, 1,000 artillery men. For a total of 10,000. Look at that. Look at that. The he federal got, occupation. He got himself an army. Well, the federal occupation of Batesville prompted Arkansas Governor Henry Massey. Hey, Massey Rector. <laughs> Henry Massey Rector. Uh, Henry Rector. That's a massive Rector. <laughs> <laughs> it prompted him to call out the militia and Ooh. move the state archives from Little Rock. Uh oh. Confederate General John Selden Rowan complained that he was left to fight with no troops, no arms, no powder, mm. and vowed to detain all Texas units in transit through the state. PGT Beauregard responded to Rowan's request for a new leader by naming General Thomas C. Hinman to take charge of the Trans Mississippi Department. <sighs> Trans, huh? Hinman's methods were high-handed, but he quickly managed to amass a field army of 4,000 Texas Cavalry, 1,500 Arkansas Infantry, 
and a battle uh, a battery of light artillery. Oster House's third division crossed the White River on May 7th, and four days later it reached the Little Red River near Searcy. The Battle of Whitney's Lane, which we did, May 19th, 1862, Texas cavalrymen attacked the Federal Foraging Party of the 17th Missouri and inflicted a loss of 15 killed, 32 wounded, and hey, two look missing. at that. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Well, the very next day, on the Union side, Carr's 2nd Division arrived on the Little Red River, ready to continue the advance. That day, a message reached Curtis from the Army's quartermaster that stated the Army could no longer be supplied over the 300-mile distance to the railroad at Rolla, Missouri. Aww. Curtis abandoned the drive on Little Rock after that. He's like, what can we do? Mm -hmm. 27th of May, Curtis ordered the cavalry of Oyster House and Carr to raid Confederate-held territory south of the Little Red River. Under cover from this operation, Union foraging parties collected more supplies. However, on the June 4th, the Federals fell back to Batesville. Curtis warned Halleck that the logistical situation was so dire that they're in straits. <laughs> was so dire that he might have to retreat to Mizzou. Oh, no. The siege of Corinth successfully ended on the 30th of May, uh -huh. so Halleck responded by sending an expedition under Graham and Fitch of the Army of James Shirk of the Navy up the river. Oh, of the Army and James Shirk of the Navy. Right. Up the White River. Yeah, we know what happened. We remember there. that. We remember that. Guys. Aside from several regiments of infantry, the transports carried 100,000 bushels of grain, 2,500 bales of hay for Curtis's army. Yeah. In the Battle of St. Charles on June 17th, the expedition suffered a setback when Confederate round we shot one. pierced the steam drum of the USS Mound City, killing half its crew and injuring most of the survivors. Yes. Remember, they started swimming uh, away and they started shooting them. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Nevertheless, the expedition pushed up river and reached Clarendon, where it was halted by low water. Hey. Curtis found that the expedition had stalled. He decided to move down the right river toward Clarendon. Okay. In order to make this move, the Union commander had to cut his supply line to Rolla and, and order his soldiers live <laughs> or live off the countryside. What do you do? Hey, hey they did too. Right. The Army of the Southwest left Batesville at the end of June. As Curtis' army moved, they forged, pillaged, and destroyed property to the amount of $1.5 million. Abetted by the soldiers, African-American slaves fled from their plantations, and over 3,000 joined the Army in its march, while others headed for Missouri. Oh, shit. I'm getting out of here, baby. Right. 24th of June, 1862, Hinman received information that Curtis's army was moving south down the east bank of the White River. He sent he sent Colonel Sweet's 15th Texas Cavalry Regiment on a raid across the White River about above Batesville. Hinman claimed that 200 Union soldiers were taken prisoner and some supply wagons were captured before Colonel Cadwallader C. Washburn's Federal Cavalry Brigade drove off the Texans. Yep, yep, yep. Him and ordered General Russ to cross the east bank of the White at Day Arc and move upstream to a blocking position behind the Cache River. Concentrating that cotton plant, Russ's force were increased to a strength of 5,000 troops. Russ is um, Confederate, by the way. Right, Confederate Russ. Um, Rebel Rust was ordered to block the roads, burn bridges, and destroy all food supplies. But this instruction was not carried oh, out. Why? Seems to be happening a lot on both all sides. Right. Him and himself remained at Duval's Bluff with about 2,000 soldiers to oppose the Union River expedition. He also armed the steamer Tom Sugg with an 8 inch Columbiad to guard the White River. He was like, Put that 8 inch Columbiad and we'll guard that White yes, River. Yes, we will. Hinman intended to leave 500 men to hold Duval's Bluff and march with the rest to reinforce Rust. But by then, as always, it was too late. Mm -hmm. Curtis advanced over the Cache. He did. <laughs> July 7th, the Army of the Southwest reached James Ferry on the Cache River, and they found that the water was low enough to ford and began to cross. Colonel Charles Edward Hovey, Hovey mm -hmm. who led a brigade on Steele's 1st Division, sent Colonel Charles Harris of the 11th Wisconsin Volunteer Infantry Regiment with mm -hmm. 400 soldiers to scout ahead. Harris's adv advance force included four companies of the 11th Wisconsin, four companies of the 33rd Illinois, and a detachment of the 1st Indiana Cavalry, including one cannon. Oh, sure. hey. nice. Harris led his forces south to a road intersection at Parley's Hill Plantation, which is about three miles northwest of Cotton Plant. Harris directed his troops down the Clarendon Road, which led towards Cotton Plant, but Hovey learned that a federal soldier was captured, recalled Harris, and ordered him to take the Des Arc Road that led to the southwest. Nice. All for one federal soldier. All for one federal soldier. Okay. Russ's force consisted of five regiments of Texas Cavalry, three regiments of Arkansas, <laughs> three regiments of Arkansas Infantry, and one battery of the artillery. Russ ordered Colonel William H. Parsons with 1,000 troopers of Parsons' own 12th Texas Cavalry 
and Colonel William Fitzhughes, 16th Texas Cavalry, to hold the river crossings at James Ferry. Can you guys hold that? We sure can. We'll try. The day before, the 12th Texas were prepared to advance, but Parsons decided to wait for the 16th Texas, which was slow. Mm-hmm. So the 12th Texas camped about six miles south of the crossing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A long way. About 9 a.m., Parsons learned that the Union soldiers were crossing the cache at the James Ferry. He turned northeast to follow the Day Arc Road and sent 20 horsemen ahead and skirmish formation across a cypress swamp. Okay. <laughs> he sent 20 horsemen ahead in skirmish formation. Okay. All right. Hobie held one Wisconsin company at the intersection and sent Harris forward with the rest. Harris's three Wisconsin companies passed the Hill House at Cornfield and then entered a forest and skirmish formation. One, how do they know this? Right. Uh, one Ill- Illinois company and the cannon backed up the skirmishers. The other three Illinois company were farther back. Okay. As the Wisconsin <laughs> skirmishers groped through hey, the underbrush. Hey, Joe Biden in it. <laughs> they spotted Parsons horsemen. First fire and started at 40 yard range between the 20 Texas skirmishers and some Union cavalry. At least three Texans were hit right away. Nope. Harris pressed forward, but his skirmishers were hit by a blast of fire when they bumped into the main body of the 12th Texas. Oh. Just bumped into them. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, <laughs> Harris was wounded, but kept directing his men. Damn right he did. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Got to. The Texas Cavalry charged on horseback, driving back the Wisconsin troops. Edward M. Pike won the Medal of Honor for actions that saved the Union cannon from capture. Yeah. You saved a cannon. Here's a Medal of Honor. You saved our medal. I'll give you a medal. <laughs> <laughs> Except for this one uh, probably was real. Maybe. Well, we ordered the three Wisconsin companies, the supporting Illinois company, and the and the gun to retreat <laughs> toward like, the gun, section. Gun, <laughs> you retreat. <laughs> it's like, I, tell you what, that damn gun don't listen. <laughs> it just stays there. Looks wanna, right at you. I want to. I want to put up a uh, court martial on the gun. <laughs> don't be doing this. Dishonorable discharge. I want to put the gun on potato duty. <laughs> <laughs> Hobie sent the remaining three Illinois companies to take cover in a cornfield. As Parsons' horsemen burst from the trees in pursuit of the Wisconsin soldiers, the Federals in Cornfield met met them with a shattering volley followed by heavy fire. Mm. After many saddles were emptied, the Texas cavalry retreated into the forest. Poor guys. Hovey held his ground and waited for the next Confederate move. Parsons' horsemen pulled back behind the Cypress Swamp. Let's get out of here, boys. No. In an attempt to separate Hovey's force from Curtis's main body, Russ accompanied Colonel James R. Taylor's 17th Texas Cavalry in a wide sweep to the northeast. Horsemen circled through Cotton Plant and neared the road intersection. <laughs> but as they approached, the Confederates heard the tap of a drum and a large number of Union soldiers rose to their feet. Oh, shit. They're hiding in the corn. The Texas <laughs> Regiment then withdrew. They said, nah, I don't want none of this shit. These Union troops were the first four Wisconsin companies, the Illinois Company, and the one gun which had rallied. Oh, good for the gun. Not long afterward, 200 Union reinforcements from the 1st Indiana arrived. Plus two additional three inch ordnance rifles. Oh, okay. shit. After an artillery barrage, Hovey organized another attack, and after about 20 minutes of fighting, the Confederates fell back. Later, General William P. Benton's brigade from the 1st Division reached the battlefield and continued the pursuit. The Confederate retreat towards Day Arc became a rout. <laughs> that evening, the Confederates got across the lower crossing of the Cache River and destroyed their boats, preventing further pursuit. This is just uh, a bunch of. It's not even like. I guess it's kind of uh, organized, but it's just a bunch of no. shit happening. It's no, not organized at all. Right. Jeez. Well, the Federals, they admitted to losing six. That was moited. Mm. 57 wounded. They claimed to have killed 138 Confederates and 66 horses. Nah. We got those six. Oh, you can. 60, what does horses do to you? You could have kept those horses. They killed 66 horses? Yeah, well, idiots. I mean, I mean, firing. Yeah. One estimate gave Confederate losses at 250. Another source estimated Confederate loss at 30. Killed and 50 to 60 wounded. One Texan reported that the 12th Texas lost 14 killed, 20 seriously wounded, 16 slightly wounded, and 2 missing. That same Texan guessed that the 16th Texas lost about the same. <laughs> I guess the loss about the same. About the same. <laughs> Curtis proceeded to Clarendon, which his troops reached on the 9th of July only to find that the flotilla had departed the previous day. Uh, always happens. Fitch and Shirk were not able to make contact with Curtis's army and wouldn't wait no longer. A bunch of bitches. Curtis ordered cannons fired and sent couriers racing downstream. But the fleet disappeared downriver. Hmm. Curtis had maintained a faint hope that he might renew his advance on Little Rock by basing on the White River. 
Right well, about that. A little hope. He had a little hope. Right. Now the federal commander realized that resupplying his troops was the highest priority. Therefore, he turned his marching columns toward Helena, which is about 45 miles to the east. Army of the Southwest occupied Helena without opposition on July 12th after a very difficult march in intense heat and clouds of dust. That's right. Union troops hailed passing transports in the Mississippi River, and the army was soon resupplied. Mm. Curtis set up his headquarters in Hinman's mansion. Oh, look at that. Took over his mansion. Yeah. In mid-summer 1862, federal military operations in the Western Theater ground to a halt. For several months, Curtis's troops remained unemployed, while greedy cotton traders swarmed in Helena. Damn. The regiments from the Army of the Southwest were eventually absorbed into the Army of the Tennessee. Union forces held Helena for the duration of the war. Oh, and on July 4th, 1863, the Helena garrison repulsed an assault by Confederate forces in the Battle of Helena. Which we will get to obviously. in July uh, 1863. Uh, Independence Day. Well, that's that. That was terrible. Mm. None of that made any sense because nothing happened. Right. Moving on, the first battle of Murfreesboro was fought on July 13th, 1862 in Rutherford County, Tennessee. Tennessee. June 10th, 1862, Union Major General Don Carlos Buell, commanding the Army of Ohio, started a leisurely advance toward Chattanooga. Brigadier General James S. Negley and his force threatened the city on June 7th and 8th. In response to the threat, the Confederate government sent Brigadier General Nathan Bedford Forrest to Chattanooga to organize a cavalry brigade. Yeah, I think you would want a cavalry. Right. Brigade, right. By July, Confederate cavalry under the command of Forrest and Colonel John Hunt Morgan were raiding into Middle Tennessee and Kentucky. It was a rolling on mm. through. Rolling. Forrest left Chattanooga on the 9th of July with two cavalry regiments and joined other units on the way bringing the total force to about, uh, to about 1,400 men. The major objective was to strike Murfreesboro and important Union Supply Center on the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad. And they were going to do this at dawn on the 13th of July. Mm, we're going to. The Murfreesboro garrison was camped in three locations around town, including detachments from four units comprising infantry, cavalry, cavalry, cavalry and artillery under the command of Brigadier General Thomas Turpin Crittenden, oh. who had just arrived on July 12th. Between 4.15 and 4.30 a.m. on the morning of July 13th, Forces Cavalry surprised the Union pickets on the Woodbury Pike east of Murfreesboro and quickly overran a federal hospital oh, oh. and the camp of a detachment of the 9th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Additional Confederate troops attacked the camps of the other Union commands in the jail and courthouse. Oh, shit. By late afternoon, all of the Union units had surrendered to force. Oh, shit. Damn, he came in just routing all them sons of bitches, huh? Well, the Confederates destroyed much of the Union supplies and tore up railroad tracks in the area. But the main result of the raid was the diversion of Union forces from a drive on Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't, I, we don't want you to know we're going, going somewhere else. We ain't going to Chattanooga. Well, this raid, along with Morgan's raid in Kentucky, made possible for Bragg's concentration of forces at Chattanooga. So General Bragg of the of the Confederates, like, perfect. Go to Chattanooga. Perfect. And his early September invasion of Kentucky, he goes, guess what? In September, I'm going to Kentucky. Yup. Mm-hmm. The next action at Murfreesboro was more prominent, which was the Battle of Stones River, known as the Battle of Murfreesboro in the South. And it was fought on December 31st, 1862, all the way to the 2nd of January, 1863. Damn, the thing went on for over a year. Over three days. Over three days. <laughs> so that's that that. pretty freaking stupid. <laughs> I mean, I guess they came in and they came in and did what they had to do, man. Prevented them from marching on Chattanooga. Right. That brings us to the Battle of Baton Rouge, which was a ground and naval battle fought in East Baton Rouge Parish, Louisiana, August 5th, 1862, all the way back in April 25th, the day before New Orleans fell to uh, Admiral David Farragut. The Confederate state government decided to abandon Baton Rouge, they sure did. moving first to Opelousas and then to Shreveport. All cotton in the area was set afire to prevent it falling into Union hands. That's waste. May 9th, Navy Commander James S. Palmer of the federal gunboat USS Iroquois landed at the town wharf and took possession without resistance of the Pentagon barracks and the arsenal. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, a party of guerrillas attacked a rowboat carrying a naval officer. Ooh. Retaliation, Farragut's flagship, the Hartford, bombarded the town, causing civilian casualties and damaging St. Joseph's Church and other buildings. May 29th, U.S. Brigadier General Thomas Williams arrived with six regiments of infantry, two artilleries, and a group of cavalry, just a group, to begin the occupation of Baton Rouge. So we'll occupy this. Right. Well, during that summer, Major General Earl Van Dorn, commander of the Confederate forces east of the Mississippi, resisted a Union bombardment at Vicksburg. He did. The Confederate ironclad ram Arkansas had come down the Yazoo River. Oh, Yazoo. 
inflicting damage on the unprepared Union fleet as she passed through and was anchored in Vicksburg. Okay. Van Dorn desired to regain Baton Rouge. It was thought that retaking Baton Rouge would be key to driving the Union out of Louisiana. Well, I don't think they hold New Orleans. Well, as they could then launch attacks along the Red River on Union-occupied territory and threaten Union control of New I don't think you are. No, you're not getting New Orleans no. back. 5,000 men in train from Vicksburg for Camp Moore, led by Major General John C. Breckenridge on July 27th. They were joined by a small infantry division led by Brigadier General Daniel Ruggles at the camp. Simultaneously, the Arkansas was sailing down the Mississippi oh. en route to engage Union ships near oh, Baton Rouge. Oh, shit. The men had a significant amount of material, spelled Canadian for some reason, hmm. or French, and were well fed. Hey. Good for them. General Williams reportedly had words of the force's departure from Camp Moore on July 28th. That's Williams of the uh, right. Union. On August 4th, after information was again received of the imminent arrival of the enemy, Union troops were formed up a mile outside of Baton Rouge. Damn right. The Union men in Baton Rouge were not experienced and were in training camp for only two weeks oh. before being sent to Baton Rouge. How many okay. times do you say Baton Rouge in this right. damn episode? The troops had few supplies because most were in New Orleans, not in Baton Rouge, which was considered more important. Of course it was. Right. I'll take New Orleans over Baton Rouge any day. Breckenridge moved to the Kamite River, 10 miles east of Baton Rouge, by August 4th, and then marched the men closer at night. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the Confederates mm -hmm. lost the element of surprise when they were discovered by Union sentries. Yeah, okay. Despite this, the attack was launched at daybreak yeah, on the 5th of August. I know you're there. Might as well do it. The Union troops were in the center of Baton Rouge, while the Confederates were lined up in two divisions north of the city. The action occurred around Florida Street mm. and began with the Confederates pushing their opponents all the way across town. Dang. Bitter fighting took place, especially around Magnolia Cemetery. Might as well, right? Right. The Union commander, Brigadier General Thomas Williams, was moited. Oh. Colonel Thomas W. Cahill took over. Oh. Well, the colonel then led a retreat back to prepared defensive lines near the penitentiary. Oh, jeez. <laughs> under the protection of Union warships. The Confederate troops began coming under fire from the gunboats. Hey. The undermanned Confederate ironclad Arkansas arrived not long after to engage Union ironclad USS Essex. Essex but her engines failed just four miles above the city. Oh, jeez. The commander ordered Arkansas set a fire to prevent her capture. Oh, get out of here. Yes. Without any prospect of naval support, Breckenridge was unable to attack the Union positions and withdrew. Union troops evacuated the city a week later. <laughs> Why? Concerned for the safety of New Orleans, but returned that autumn. Jeez. Right. So when they left, nobody, the Confederates didn't come in and be like, hey. It's not the whole thing about Watt and Baton Rouge. Right. Really didn't mean anything. Yeah. Not. The Confederates occupied Port Hudson, which they held for almost another year. Cool. Hmm. Cool. The Battle of Baton Rouge commemorative ceremony is held every year on the first Saturday in August in and around Magnolia Cemetery, sponsored by the Foundation for Historical Louisiana. That was pointless battle, did nothing. Yeah, and they left a month or a week later anyways. So They're stupid. like, we don't even want this damn That's city. Guys are That's, I'm telling you what. what you can do, man? Ow. Convince me that this war lasted four and a half years <laughs> for political reasons. There's no reason for it. None at all. The Battle of Kirksville is our next battle. Let's see if this is actually fucking something. Now. <sighs> Fought in the town of Kirksville, Missouri, oh, okay. August 6, 1862. Right. Confederate Colonel Joseph C. Porter had been recruiting in the Macon area. Confederate Colonel Joseph C. Porter had been recruiting in the Macon area to the south of Kirksville. Okay. He had assembled a brigade of between 1,500 and 2,500 ill trained, poorly equipped troops. But his irregulars had harried and recruited as far north as Memphis, Missouri. Right. Confederate sympathies in the Kirksville area were high, though Union sentiment was stronger than in the surrounding counties. Okay. Uh, due to Southern heritage of most of the residents. That's okay. Confederate sympathies in the Kirksville area were high due to Southern heritage of most of the residents, but Union sentiment was stronger than in surrounding counties. So there's a lot of Union troops here and strong uh, Southerns. Well, Confederate sympathies in Kirksville area were high due to Southern heritage of most of the residents although Union sentiment was stronger than in surrounding areas. Okay. Porter had been urged to come to Kirksville by Confederate Captain Tice Kane and an Adair County farmer who claimed to be holding Kirksville with 500 fresh recruits. He's like, I got these mofos. I got 500 people under my command. Get your ass down here quick, quick. In one of the battle's mysteries, Kane disappeared and was never heard from again. <laughs> wow. According to a descendant. Wow. Just left. He's like, fuck this. He, right. he trained all these people or whatever. And then when he saw what real war was, he's like, yeah, this ain't for me. I'm oh, leaving. I'm old. <laughs> Union Colonel John McNeil, the 2nd Missouri Cavalry, and his troops, totaling about a thousand, have been 
pursuing Porter for more than a week. Oh, geez. Finally got him, huh? Before noon on August 6th, 6th, McNeil attacked Porter in the town of Kirksville where the Confederates had concealed themselves at homes and stores and among the crops in the nearby fields, oh. especially in the county courthouse and the commercial buildings on the square. Okay. Their presence was discovered by a Union detachment that volunteered to ride around the square in order to draw fire and cause the Confederates to reveal themselves. Oh, idiots. An act of courage was cost two Union soldiers their lives. Hey, though. what are you going to do? McNeil deployed his artillery before moving in a broad line towards the town square. Yeah, oh, another trap in the town oh, square. Oh, man, idiots. Jeez. Well, the cannon fire demoralized the defenders. I'm sure it did. Some of whom retreated behind a rail fence west of the square. The Union troops then advanced in two wings with Le Lieutenant Colonel William F. Schaffer <coughs> of the 2nd Mizzou yeah. in command of the Union right wing, Major Henry Clay Caldwell of the 3rd Iowa Cavalry in charge of the left. As the two wings met, they succeeded in driving the Confederates from the courthouse. Oh, Porter's remaining forces yielded ground and joined others behind the rail fence. <laughs> from this position, the Confederates poured heavy fire into McNeil's men, but were ultimately overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. The battle began at 11 a.m. and was over by 2 p.m. Good hours, three hours fighting. Good for them. The Federals then secured the town, capturing numerous prisoners, driving away the remaining Confederates. Three days later, another Union force arrived and finished the work begun at Kirksville, virtually destroying Porter's command. Well, bye bye, Porter. Yep. According to a letter sent by resident uh, Jay Martin, written a week after the battle, Confederate dead numbered about 200, Union 30. McNeil's official tally was 150 Confederates killed, three to 400 wounded. Against six Union deaths, where 32 were wounded. Oh. Two civilian casualties. I mean, you're fighting in town. Surprised there's not more than that. Right. Uh, we're noted James Dye, who was a 60 year old farmer with two sons in the Union. Uh, he was held overnight by Porter during his approach oh, to the town. Geez. Then told to be on his way, but shot as he left. Oh, man. <laughs> the other was Miss Elizabeth Cutts. Most Kirksville residents had heeded Porter's warning to depart, but Cutts was shot when two Confederate soldiers attempted to enter the cellar where she was hiding. She was hit by a Union bullet meant for them as she ran out, though. Oh, geez. John L. Porter, a prominent, not related to the other Porter. Prominent local citizen. We don't know that. At, no relation to the Confederate leader. We don't know that. Oh, it says it. <laughs> <laughs> John L. Porter, a prominent local citizen, no relation to the Confederate leader, hey. asked for and was granted permission to treat the Confederate wounded. Yep, and then they murdered him. No. Nope. Nope. McNeil supplied a surgeon and instruments. The departed, the departed Porter from the rebels, having previously commandeered all medical equipment. Of course he did. The departed porter had previously commandeered all medical equipment. He's like, I'm taking this. Thank you. Might you need them? The Confederate dead were deposited in several mass graves at Forest Llewellyn Cemetery. A monument now marks this very spot. Okay. Some were later recovered by their families. Fifteen Confederates were quickly court-martialed on McNeil's orders. Executed Jeez. for having violated previous parole agreements not to mm -hmm. take up arms. See, they were already caught once, sent on their way. They said, you will not take up arms against us, or that, that was the punishment on parole. Although the execution was uh, permissible within military norms, it was seldom done. And McNeil has been criticized for both the justice and necessity of the proceedings. Hey, man, you got TC's guy's oh, message. Right. We let you go. Right. And you promised not to take up arms right. against us again. You got caught again. Right. And you tried killing us. Right. You would kill us if you had another chance. Exactly. Idiots. A number of other questionable shootings followed, including those of Dr. John mm -hmm. Davis, said by some to have been told to run and then was shot when he did. Of course. And Lieutenant Colonel Frisbee McCullough, a subordinate of Porter, was tried and sentenced to death as a bushwhacker, even though he was captured wearing a regular Confederate uniform and carrying letters authorizing him to recruit troops. Hmm. Oh. He was granted permission to give the order to fire, and his final words were, May God forgive you for this cold-blooded murder. Aim at the heart. Fire! A second volley was necessary. Jeez. How many people was there? They didn't hit him in the first try? Jeez. Idiots, dude. Did what is it? With did this? you always see like the the uh the 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 uh, barbarism from the southern side? But I'm telling you, the north was worse or just as bad. These guys murdered and raped and burned and uh, entire villages. Well, I haven't seen none of that yet. Uh, what you have? Besides you Curtis, just in the last oh, part. When he was here burning down, they didn't burn down the town. Basically, murdering people for no reason. Murdered the people that were on parole. Not this guy. Not yeah. the doctor. Not the good doctor. I mean, that's debatable. Is it? Didn't say that really take place. Of course it did. 
Oh, question mark. Said by see? some to have been told to run and then shot when he did. Well, it's not that it's not confirmed. It's confirmed. I don't know that. Yeah. He shot himself in the back. Possible. <laughs> Three times. Right. McNeil's reputation will be darkened further by the Palmyra Massacre. Palmyra? Yeah. Palmyra Massacre on the 18th of October, 1862. That's a few months ahead here. I'm mm-hmm. sure we'll have that. Mm-hmm. But he would go on to serve two terms as sheriff of St. Louis County. <laughs> died okay. tragically June 7th, 1891. Porter died on February 18th, 1863 of wounds received in an engagement at Hartville. Uh-huh. I mean, he didn't live very long. No. Nope. Well, a couple more months. Right. The victory of Kirksville helped consolidate Union dominance in northeastern Mizzou. Memorial Park commemorates the battle, the approximate location of the Union, Union artillery. Okay, good for them. Right. So all in all, really no Nothing. significance of any of these battles. Nothing. Um, it was. Uh, we'll be back next week for the battles of Donaldsonville, Cedar Mountain, Nueces, and Compton's Ferry as well. Another four battles. And then we'll be getting pretty damn close to uh, mm-hmm. Manassas, dude. To Manassas. To, to Battle uh, of Manassas. To Dos Manassas. You just now sent me that oh. episode. Oh. <laughs> Dos Manassas. Ah, it's not going to load. But yeah, we're getting really, 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 really close. I say within the next episode or episode or two, we'll be at. Uh, the second battle of Manassas and another Union route with that. Tune in to Outlaws and Gunslingers where we'll be on the Reagan assassination attempt. And then um, over on this week in sports history, we got a lot of uh, stuff over there. So <laughs> go check it out. Stuff. Bang Dang Network and uh, Creative Control Network for Outlaws and Gunslingers. We'll be back next week for Donaldson, Cedar, Mill Creek, and whatever the other two were. And we'll see you then. We're the Mouth of Michiganers with Bang and Dang.